Modern debates about the person of Jesus, in many respects, have the same characteristics as ancient ones. Namely, how is it that Jesus can be both human and divine? Aren't these categories mutually exclusive? So in order to get a grip on the character of modern debates, it's going to be important to start at the beginning and look at the historical antecedents to the way Christians came to talk about Jesus. It's very clear from the very beginning that Jesus was viewed by Christians as human. Uh, the New Testament states that he was born of a woman, born under the law. Uh, Paul makes that point in Galatians and he speaks in Romans about him being descended from David according to the flesh. But at the same time, it's also quite clear that Christians thought of Jesus as not simply or merely human. We get this by the fact that he's referred to as Lord, the Greek term kyrios. Now that term can have a very innocuous meaning. It can mean simply sir in colloquial Greek of the time. But it was the term that was used by the translators into Greek of the Hebrew scriptures for the divine name, the tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H. And so when the early Christians applied this to Jesus, it seems pretty clear they were giving him special status. In addition to the word kyrios, other aspects of the New Testament also speak to Christians viewing Jesus as more than simply human. An obvious passage here would be Philippians 2, particularly verses 7 through 9, where it is said that Jesus receives the name that is above every name, the divine name again, on account of his obedience unto death. Likewise, in his letter to the Romans, Paul also speaks about Jesus having been declared Son of God by the Holy Spirit through his resurrection from the dead. Now, both these texts might be taken to suggest that Jesus' divinity, his more than human status, is something that he acquires after death or through time. On the other hand, we have the opening verses of John, which speak of Jesus as the incarnation of the Word that was with God in the beginning. In any case, it's clear that Jesus began to be viewed very early on as having more than human significance. We have particularly strong evidence that by the early second century, Jesus was being viewed as divine. We have the record of the Roman governor, Pliny the Younger, writing the emperor Trajan, reporting that some Christians he had arrested worshiped Christ as God. And perhaps still more significant, we have an early Christian sermon, it's called Second Clement which opens with the words, Brothers and sisters, we ought so to think of Jesus Christ as of God, for if we expect little from him, we shall receive little. And this last passage is significant because it suggests something of the logic behind Christian confession of Jesus as not only human but also divine. It had to do with the belief that Jesus saves. For persons coming out of the Jewish tradition, only God can save. And so if you confess that Jesus saves, it follows that Jesus must be more than human. Jesus can be no less than God. Now, of course, that by itself doesn't address the question of what exactly it means to say that Jesus is God or Jesus is divine. Because in the Greco-Roman world in which Christianity took root, there were notions of different levels of divinity. So that, for example, when the average Roman confessed Caesar as Lord, they were not confessing that Caesar was the creator of heaven and earth or anything like that. For the average Roman, worshiping Caesar was not that big a deal because they accepted that there were a whole range of divinities and Caesar was one among many. Again, for Christians, in line with the Jewish tradition, there was no such gradation of divinity. There was only one God, the God of Israel who rescued uh, his people from Egypt and who was the creator of heaven and earth. There were no levels. And so, for that reason, it was impossible for Jews and Christians to confess Caesar as Lord because they couldn't accept the kind of gradation of divinity that was common in the Greco-Roman period. Instead, it seemed one was either the one God of Israel or one was not God at all. And that created the question, what do we make of Jesus, who certainly has characteristics that are not divine? He is born, he dies. Moreover, he clearly distinguishes himself from the one he calls father and whom he identifies with the God of Israel. The intervening centuries between the first and the fourth have many debates, which I won't go into here, but it became clear eventually to Christians that they had to say that Jesus was was, as Savior, fully God, somehow of the same substance, that was the key word, with the one God of Israel. And the consequence of this was the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, which said precisely that the Son, the one who was incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth, was, along with the Holy Spirit, 
of the same substance as the Father, so that God was but one, the one God of Israel, but subsisting in three persons or hypostases, three identities, but only one God. From this perspective, the Trinity is simply the way in which Christians came about claiming that Jesus was worthy of worship, truly God, while at the same time insisting that God was only one. The problem was, having confirmed finally, having agreed on the principle that Jesus was truly God, the question then became, well, what do we make of his humanity? It isn't that Christians began to question Jesus' humanity. There were some Christians, it appears, early on in the early centuries who did question Jesus' humanity. They were called docetists, a word that comes from the Greek term for to seem, because they claimed that Jesus only seemed to be human. Allegedly, some of them believed Jesus left no footprints. But those groups were long since extinct by the time of the Trinitarian doctrinal developments I'm talking about. No, the questions that emerged after the doctrine of the Trinity was formulated in the late fourth century was not whether Jesus was human, but exactly how he could be human. There were several proposals that came up. One particularly noteworthy one was proposed by Apollinaris, the bishop of Laodicea in what's now southwestern Turkey. He suggested that the way to think of the incarnation was that Jesus had a fully human body and in fact a fully human soul, but his cognitive capacities, his mind, was replaced by the divine Logos, the second person of the Trinity. And so Jesus was kind of a blend or a hybrid, a divine mind and a human body. It was an intriguing solution, but the majority of Christians rejected it. And they rejected it because they were convinced, in the words of Gregory of Nazianzus, a great bishop of the time, that in order for Christ to save, he had to take on the fullness of human nature. If the point of salvation was that God takes on the human condition, God just couldn't take on part of it. God had to take on the whole of it, including the human mind. And so, Jesus couldn't be viewed as a combination of divine and human traits. Somehow, Jesus had to be confessed as being human in every respect and being divine in every respect. At the culmination of a number of debates, which had severe consequences for the life of the church in the Roman Empire, finally in 451, the emperor Marcion called a council at Chalcedon, a suburb of Constantinople. And that council issued what became known as the Chalcedonian Definition. It reads as follows in its important parts. We unanimously teach one and the same Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in divinity and perfect in humanity, the same truly God and truly man, composed of rational soul and body, the same one in being with the Father as to the divinity and one in being with us as to the humanity to be acknowledged in both natures, without confusion or change, without division or separation. The distinction between the natures was never abolished by their union, but rather the character proper to each of the two natures was preserved as they came together in one person and one hypostasis. The formula was controversial at the time. It failed to reconcile those Christians east of the Roman Empire who had already broken with the imperial church earlier in the fifth century. And it alienated profoundly Christians in Syria and Egypt who remain uh, separated from the imperial church thereafter. But it did satisfy the majority of Christians in the empire and has remained the official position of Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, and most Protestant churches ever since. What is the definition trying to say? It's really trying to make two fundamental points. First, against Apollinaris of Laodicea and others like him, it's trying to argue that Jesus is not partly God and partly human, but rather fully God and fully human at the same time. That is the force of those two adverbial phrases, without confusion or change, each nature retaining its integrity in the incarnation. At the same time, it's also trying to say that Jesus is not two separate subjects, one divine and one human, that are somehow shadowing each other. Instead, Jesus is just a single subject. That's the force of the other two adverbial phrases, without division and without separation. Now, when it comes to the question of how it can be the case that both humanity and divinity are combined in this way, one subject with two integral natures, the definition doesn't say. In this sense, it's important to recognize what it means for it to be a definition. Literally, it sets boundaries. But really, so long as you don't say anything that suggests that there are two Jesuses, 
on the one hand. And so long as you don't say anything that suggests that Jesus is somehow a composite made up of bits of divinity and humanity, the definition leaves a lot of freedom for talking about Christ's person. Nevertheless, and this is where I want to start to focus the discussion, the Chalcedonian definition did lead to certain ways of thinking and talking about Christ that created problems. For example, at the time of Chalcedon, the Pope, Leo I, or Leo the Great, wrote an influential letter to his counterpart, the Archbishop of Constantinople, Flavian. In that letter, he wrote the following. Each nature does what is proper to each in communion with the other. One shines forth with miracles, the other succumbs to injuries. Now the difficulty with this way of putting things is that it suggests, what? That Jesus' life can be viewed as having two separate dimensions that can really be observed separately. A human dimension, which is fundamentally passive. Jesus' humanity is revealed in what he suffers, in his injuries, and ultimately in his death. By contrast, Jesus' activity, what Jesus does, what gives him his characteristics as a person, that's where the divinity shines forth in the miracles, the teaching, the ways in which Jesus shows himself to be a particular individual character. Now the difficulty with that way of framing things, of course, 